this lecture is going to be on mathematical induction. Um, so induction is a key property of the integers. And in particular, it's, it's, it's how we really understand the additive structure of the integers. So um, there, there's a key property of the positive integers, at least. So um, what is that? We, we, can, we can get to any integer, or any positive integer, let's say, by repeatedly adding 1. <laughs> okay. Um, now, this seems like a fairly basic observation. Uh, you probably didn't need me to tell you this. <laughs> um, but uh, this actually has some, some pretty uh, far-reaching consequences. We can use this to prove many uh, non-trivial facts about the integers. So before I, I talk about how you might do that, um, I just want to point out there are actually two ways of thinking about this. So the first way is, let's say we want to get 2 to number 5, for example. We could start with 1 and then start adding 1s. So we get to 2, we get to 3, etc. Okay, that's sort of the iter iter iterative way um, of, of thinking about induction. There's another way of thinking about it. Let's say we want to get to 5. Um, and we, yeah, can, can we get to 5 just by starting at 1 and repeatedly adding 1s? Well, we could if we could get to 4, because 5 is 1 more than 4. Okay, so if I know I could get to 4 by repeatedly adding 1s, I could certainly get to 5. So now we look at 4. Can we get to 4 by repeatedly adding 1s? Uh, we can go kind of one level back. Uh, if we get to 3, then it would be easy, because then we could just uh, get 4 is 3 plus 1. And uh, you can kind of recurse back like this until we, we finally hit 1. These numbers are getting smaller and smaller. Eventually, we're going to hit 1. Um, OK. So there, there's sort of two ways of thinking about um, any of the arguments that we're, we're going to we're going to see in this lecture, um, but uh, yeah. So so what what are we getting at? So there, there's a method of proof. Um, is very commonly uh, used when we want to prove, for example, a, a certain formula um, for 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 a sequence of numbers, uh, but it's very versatile. Uh, so, 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 so this is called uh, yeah, proof, proof by mathematical induction, and uh, the way it works is uh, yeah. Suppose we want we want to prove just any kind of statement. So, so some kind of statement, some statement about the uh, positive integers. There are two steps. So first, we're going to prove the statement for the integer 1, say n equals 1. That's usually uh, fairly easy, because we're only dealing with one case. Uh, but we want to prove the statement about all of the positive integers. So um, the second step is going to be to show that um, Say under the assumption, under the assumption that uh, the statement holds for some integer n, then it also must hold for the next integer. It also must hold for n plus one. Okay. Well, uh, that's all we need to do. If these two things are true, then uh, the statement must be true for every positive integer. And the reason is, uh, suppose that uh, we want to show, for example, it's true for some number 5. Okay. Um, part 2 shows us that um, you know, if we know it's true for 4, 
then uh, it must be true for five. And I should say that this is something that we're going to have to prove every time when we when we have a new statement we want to prove. Um, but suppose we know that it's true for four, then it must be true for five. But do we know it's true for four? Uh, no, but if we knew it was true for three, we would know it's true for four. Um, and if we knew it was true for two, we would know it is true for three. So it's sort of this chain of, of truth. Um, and if we knew it was true for one, then it's true for two. But part one uh, proved a statement for n equals one. We already proved it, it's true for one. So we can kind of trace back here. It's true for one, must be true for two, must be true for three, must be true for four, must be true for five. Uh, so that's, that's sort of how induction works. Um, the best way to learn this is to see some examples. We're, we're just going to see a bunch of examples of this today. Um, and we'll use this uh, throughout the course, sometimes rather informally, I should say. Um, okay, so first example. Um, like I said, you, you can often use this to prove uh, formulas for uh, certain sequences of numbers. So what do I mean by sequence of numbers? Well, for example, we could take the squares. So uh, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc. Uh, so these are the squares, uh, square numbers. Um, it's pretty obvious that the, uh, the nth square is given by just uh, n squared. <laughs> That's the formula uh, for the nth squared. So 36 would be 6 squared. Um, just by definition. So uh, let's take a different sequence. We'll take uh, one that's a little bit lesser known called the triangular numbers. 10, 15, 21, 28. How am I uh, defining the triangular numbers? So these are numbers that you can make into a triangle. So I can have one, I can have three, six, I mean like a perfect equilateral triangle like this. Uh, I can have 10, uh, you get the idea. Uh, just like uh, these are numbers that you can make into squares. That's why we call them square numbers. Um, okay, so these are triangular numbers. Uh, let me write that out. Triangular. Suppose we wanted a formula for the nth triangular number. That's not as obvious as it was for the squares. The formula for the nth square number is just n squared. What's the formula for the nth triangular number? Um, well, here's one way I can do it. Let's say I take one of these triangles. And so I'm going to draw out the case for 4. Um, but a general case is similar. Um, and I just uh, kind of move the triangle, turn it into a right triangle like this. But it's still the same number. I'm going to take an exact copy of this and uh, rotate it 180 degrees. Okay, and I'll put it right here. Okay, so there's the same number. And um, if this is n, this is n. This is now n plus 1. See, there's an additional 1 uh, layer here. And so uh, if I take the nth triangular number, I'll call that Tn, and I multiply by 2, I get a rectangle of a dimensions n by n plus 1. So this is the total number of dots there. Uh, that means that the nth triangular number is uh, n times n plus 1 over 2. OK. Um, so, I mean, that really is a proof. That's a, that's a proof by a picture. Um, let's say we, we really want to be sure this formula worked. Um, it's, it's a bit stranger looking than, than this one. Um, well, we can actually prove this is true for every number uh, by induction. This can be useful, too, because sometimes pictures can be deceiving. So let's try to prove this by induction. Um, so we want to prove... Uh, we want to prove this. Yeah, we want to show that the nth triangular number is uh, n times n plus 1 over 2. OK, um, does this formula work for n equals 1? That's the first step. 
uh, it's very important to, to check uh, for n equals one. Um, okay, if this doesn't work, then uh, nothing that follows is going to going to matter. Um, you plug in one, so one plus one over two. That's two over two, which is one. That is indeed the first triangular number, so that's good. Now what we want to do is we want to suppose the formula works uh, for for n. Okay. So so what do I mean by that? I mean if I take a triangle and how am I getting these triangles? So taking a triangle with n layers. Well, the triangle is just one plus two. See, so the next layer is two, then three, then four. So one plus two plus three plus four. Uh, Etc. up to n. Um, I'm supposing the formula works. So this thing I'm writing down right now, I am assuming this is true. Okay. So under the assumption that it's true, may or may not be true, right? But I'm assuming that it's true, and I'm saying that if it's true, this formula should also work for the next larger number, n plus one. So here's what I want to do. I want to take. Uh, the next larger triangular number, so add one layer to the triangle. And I'm not going to write down n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2, because that's what I want to prove. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not assuming that in advance. I want to show, uh, eventually, see, so I'll, I'll put over here maybe. So eventually I want to show that this is, uh, the same formula works. So you plug in n plus 1 into this formula instead of n, which will give you my, my n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. Um, but I'm not assuming that that's equal to that. I want to prove that that's equal to that, given the line above. Uh, okay. Well, how, let's use the line above, right? We, we have something that we're assuming is true. Let's use it. I can replace this bit here with n times n plus 1 over 2. And now we just do a little bit of algebra. So let's add this to uh, the n plus 1. Um, I have a denominator of two, so maybe I want to multiply this by two over two like that. Uh, so my numerator is going to be n squared plus n plus two n plus, uh, am I doing this right? Yeah, plus two over two. Uh, what is this? It's uh, n squared plus three n plus two over two. I'm getting dangerously close to this, but uh, I notice actually that uh, this can be factored as n plus 1 times n plus 2. So we can actually put an equal sign here. And this is, this is, this is true. So we, we just confirmed. Assuming it works for n, it also works for n plus 1. We've now proven that this formula works for all positive integers. Okay, so that's uh, induction. Uh, let's do a slightly more complicated example. So I know some of you have seen this before, but um, so it's so another example. Um, here's a formula that's much harder to come up with. So we'll take uh, the squares here. Let's, let's do something involving the squares. So um, I claim that if I add up the first n squares uh, up to n squared, I get, um, let's see if I remember this. So I think it's n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Okay, <laughs> so more complicated looking formula, but there is a nice formula apparently for the sum of the first n squared numbers, okay? Um, let's check that this works. So does it work for n equals 1? Well, the sum of the first 1 square is 1. Uh, but let's plug it into this formula. So we get 1 times 2 times 2 plus 1 is 3. That's 6 over 6, which equals 1. So that's true. That works out. Next, we assume it's true. Assume it's true for um, n equals, uh, well, just for, for some, some arbitrary number n. Okay, so n can be any, any positive integer. 
we want to show it works for the next number. So we want to show it also holds for n plus 1. How do we do that? Let's write out um, everything up to n plus 1. Okay. I want to show that this equals, uh, I guess, this formula, but with n replaced by n plus 1. Um, but I'm assuming it's true for n. So immediately I see uh, this sum as part of my larger sum. I can replace this bit with n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Okay. Let's just do the same kind of trick here. So. It's basically just the previous problem, a, a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm thinking I probably don't want to multiply this all out because I might have to factor a cubic at the end of this. Um, I see there's there's an n plus 1 in both of these. So, so why don't we pull out that n plus 1? And then we have left over here a 2n plus 1 times n. So we've got a 2n squared plus n. And what do we have in this one? We have an extra factor of n plus 1 times a 6. So I'm going to get a, n, a 6n plus 6. And this will all be over 6. Um, okay, so that's n plus 1, uh, 2n squared plus 7. This is, a, this is a useful trick, by the way. Uh, it might come up multiple times. So we see the same factor of n plus 1 there. So why don't we just pull that out rather than multiplying this out and then realizing at the very end that we might be able to factor this cubic and pull out an n plus 1. Um, so uh, what do we have here? Plus 6 over 6. Well, what are we looking at? Is this the formula with n plus 1 plugged in for n? Um, well, let's try to factor this quadratic part. So uh, I'm running out of room there. So it's n plus 1. Uh, this looks like it should factor to me. Um, it looks to me like, um, well, <laughs> maybe we can guess what it is, right? So uh, I'm guessing we're getting an n plus 2. Uh, what would the other factor be then? It'll be a 2n plus uh, 3 to get to 6. And does that work? Uh, 2 times 2n plus 3n is 7n. So this does work. So I can write this as this. Um, is this what we're going for? Uh, yeah, I think it is. So oh, why is that? Because, uh, see, I can re rewrite this last bit as 2 times n plus 1 uh, plus 1. And this bit is n plus 1 plus 1. And this is n plus 1. So this is just this formula here with n plus 1 plugged in for n. That's exactly what I wanted to show. Okay. And so this formula works for every, every sum of squares, any integer n. Um, okay, yeah, I, sh I just mentioned the base case is really important. So um, j here's just a kind of a fun little example. So, so let's say it's, um, suppose that, uh, just another example, that um, if, it, uh, it rains today, or in any one day, it will rain the next day, and so on, right? Um, does that mean it will rain forever? What do you think? So, so let's say on any given day, on any day, it doesn't have to be exactly today, but if it rains on any day, it'll rain the next day. Does that mean it'll always be raining? Well, when you think about it, uh, we, we don't quite have enough information, right? If it were raining now, then yes, it will rain forever because of this logic, right? It'll rain the next day, and then it's raining tomorrow, so it'll rain the day after tomorrow, etc. That's induction. Um, so, so the answer is yes, but only if it is raining today. <laughs> if it is raining now. <laughs> so we need to know that piece of information. If it's not raining now, 
then th this doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so uh, that that's the base case, really. So we have to check, is it raining now? If it is, then um, if, if this first part is true, then it's going to be raining forever. Okay, so, so we really need both of these pieces. Um, okay, let's go to a new page. Um, so you know, what we saw here is actually, um, this is a... This is a pretty famous formula. This is, a, this is actually an example of a, an arithmetic series. Okay, we're just adding um, 2 is 1 more than 1, 3 is 1 more than 2. There's a fixed difference between the terms in the series. So one other kind of series I just want to mention. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll use a series later as well. So, so the geometric series. And uh, this is something like if you take 1 plus... Uh, uh, 3, let's say, plus 3 squared, 9, plus 27, plus 81. Take the powers of a, si a single number, you know, up to some uh, up, up to some point. We, we don't want to go forever because then the sum will be infinity. Um, okay, and in general, we want to do 1 plus a plus a squared, taking the powers, okay, up to, let's say, a to the n. Uh, is there a nice formula for the sum? Uh, yes, there is. And uh, there's kind of a trick to remember it, or to drive it again if you forget it. The trick is you take this and you, there's kind of a magical thing you multiply it by. And that is uh, 1 minus a. If you multiply it by 1 minus a, what does this do? Well, let's expand it out. So 1 times the whole series is just this. And I have a minus a times this, right? What is that doing? It's sort of just shifting everything over, right? So I'm going to get... The one is going to be here, but it'll be a, a time, times a minus a, negative minus a squared, minus a cubed, etc. Minus a to the n. That was actually the a to the m minus one term, but times a minus a. And I have an extra term here. And what you see is, uh, <laughs> so I'm adding this to that essentially. Everything's going to cancel except these last two parts. So I'm going to get one minus a to the n plus one. Okay, so my geometric series times this equals that, which means the sum of my original geometric series, I can write in sort of a more succinct uh, form here, is 1 minus a to the n plus 1, or 1 minus a. And uh, you know, we, we often want to pull out the negatives, um, cancel them out, just to, because... A is, a is going to be a positive integer, so we have a negative over a negative here. Let's, let's just write it as quotient of two positives. And, I mean, this really is a proof that this, this works, but um, you could also try to prove this. It's good practice to try to prove this using induction. Uh, it works pretty much the same as uh, what we just did. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, another example, Fibonacci numbers. This is one of the most interesting sequences of positive integers. And they have lots of interesting properties, but what are they? Um, you start with one, start with two ones, in fact, and then you add the two previous numbers to get the next one. Okay, so two plus three is five, three plus five is eight. 13, see how I'm getting these? I'm adding the two previous ones. So 21 is 8 plus 13. I'm ignoring the, the rest of them. Um, okay. And so I'll call this one, this is F1, F2, F3, etc. This is sort of my indexing set. Uh, so F8 is 21. The defining property is fn equals the sum of the two previous ones. All right. Um, these have a lot of super interesting number theoretic properties, which uh, we'll, we'll get into later. Um, but for now, let me just show that you can use induction uh, to, to prove various interesting things about uh these numbers. So, so here's one example. Let, let's take sums of these. We already did sums of, you know, one, one through n. We did sums of squares. 
let's take sums of this sequence. So let's look at uh, 1, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. Maybe we don't even know what we're, uh, what we're trying to get, but we're just investigating, see if we can find a pattern here. Um, this is where a lot of interesting math comes from, just by trying to investigate things, find a pattern. Uh, so what's this first one? It's uh, 1, 2, and then 4, and then we get uh, 7, 12, uh, 20. Um, okay, so maybe it's a good time to pause, and uh, why don't you take a look at these numbers here and see if you spot uh, anything interesting. So see if we can find a pattern here. Okay, um, so pause the video if you, uh, if you need more time, but uh, if you look back up at this sequence here, I'm noticing that 20 is one less than 21, 12 is one less than 13, okay, seven is one less than eight. So it appears that the sum of the first, uh, so F1 plus F2 plus F3, et cetera, up to Fn, sum of the first n Fibonacci numbers is, uh, let's be careful and get it right. So uh, let's try an example. Sum of the first five is the seventh one minus one, right? So it looks like I'm doing Fn plus two minus one, okay? So this is my guess for a formula. This seems to work, at least for the examples we've tried. We can now use a uh, property of induction, the, the proof, uh, proof by mathematical induction, to uh, show that this property is indeed true. This always works. How do we do that? Uh, does it work for, uh, so this is the guess. <laughs> this is a formula for the sum. Really nice formula, just in terms of one Fibonacci number. Um, does it work for, for uh, F1? Is F1, equal to the sum of the first one Fibonacci numbers is equal to F3 minus one. F3 is two, two minus one is one. Great, that works. Let's assume it's true. Maybe we'll be getting a little bit, bit less uh, formal about this, but uh, let's assume it's true for, for, for this, for the first n. Is it true for uh, the first n plus one? Let's try to use the same patterns before. We see this sum here. We're assuming that that equals to this, fn plus two minus one. So we know that this sum here is fn plus two plus fn plus one minus one. And might kind of be stuck here. Like where, where do we go with this exactly? Um, well, uh, these aren't just ordinary numbers, right? These are Fibonacci numbers, and they have a defining property, which is this. The sum of any two consecutive ones is equal to the, ne the, the next term in the sequence. I see two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. That's Fn plus 3. Um, and that's what we're trying to do, right? We showed that uh, if the formula works for n, it works for n, pl n plus 1. This is just that formula with n plus one plugged in for n. Um, so that, that seemed remarkably easy, even though this is, um, yeah, this is maybe something that doesn't seem like it should be easy to prove at all. Uh, but I just took this amount of space here. Um, okay, so I wanna do maybe uh, one or two examples that don't really follow the same pattern, but still use this property of induction. So, um, Let's start with, uh, yeah, let's, let's be called the coin problem. So the coin problem, suppose I have, I have uh, two kinds of coins. Um, and this is a number three class, so uh, they're probably not going to be Nice even numbers, uh, like fives, tens, twenties. 
Um, it's probably going to be something weird. So let's do uh, let's do four cents and seven cents. Four cents and seven cents. Um, okay. And the question is, what amounts can I make? What amounts can I make? Um, I just want to point out one thing. What if I replace a 7 with a 6? All of a sudden, we see that we, we have two even numbers here. Right? So we're never going to be able to make any odd number because we're adding up two even numbers. We're never going to get an odd number. Um, here we have an even number and an odd number. We can potentially maybe get a lot of different amounts. But at the same time, there are a lot of amounts that I cannot make. So let's, let's write down some of those. So amounts I cannot make uh, just by combinations of these coins. So cannot make. Let's say I have an infinite amount of each coin, or, or just a large amount of each coin. <laughs> um, so amounts I cannot make, uh, I certainly cannot make one cent. <laughs> I can't make two, three, I can make four, right? I cannot make five, uh, I cannot make six. I could make seven, just one of these. I can make eight by using two of these coins, right? Um, I don't see a way to make nine uh, or 10 for that matter, uh, but I can do 11. 11 is four plus seven. I can do 12 if I take three of these. Um, I don't see a way to do 13. Hopefully I'm not missing anything here. Uh, 14, we can do two of these. 15, we can do one of these, two of these. 16, we can get just with the four cents. Um, 17, can we get 17? I don't think so. Yeah, so 17 I'm going to put here. And, uh... 18 is, is, is possible. So let's actually, now it's getting kind of confusing. So let me, let me write down just to verify these are possible. So 18, we can do, uh, we can do, uh, we can do one of the four plus two of the seven. 19, can we do that? Uh, we could do, uh, Ah, we can do three of the four plus one of the seven. 20, we can do five of the fours. 21, we can do the sevens. Uh, so we can do three times the seven. And um, I'm actually going to stop here. Not because uh, I don't feel like doing any more, um, but because I, I feel like I'm done, actually. I'm done with the problem. And here's why. So these amounts we can't make. I might have missed something. Maybe one of these you can make. Uh, but uh, essentially, these are small numbers. We can just check all the possibilities, right? We can't have negative coins either. So so we can either have 0, 1, 2, 3 of, of each coin type. Um, why? How do I know I'm going to be able to make everything else? Well, we can make 18 through 21, OK? How can I make 22? I'm not going to think too hard about it. I know I can make 18. 18 plus 4 is 22. Right? And 4 is one of our denominations. So in order to get an arrangement for, for, for the 22, all I need to do is add one 4 cent piece. Right? So I just need to add one 4 cent piece. Can I get 23? Yes. Same idea. I know I can get 19. I checked. If I add one four cent piece, I can get 23. Same with 24, 25. And see, this is the same idea at the beginning. We were just adding ones. But here we're sort of adding things in groups of four. So as soon as we get four consecutive uh, numbers that are obtainable, we can always just add four cent pieces and get the next four to be obtainable. And then we get the next four to be obtainable. So I know I can make any amount uh, 18 and over. Okay, and this is really a version of induction. So, just to complete this, so I can just um, take this group of four, 
shift it down. Uh, this is one of my denominations, so I can just add an extra coin that's worth four cents. Um, yeah, this feels just like induction. However, um, I'm not going from n plus one or from n to n plus one. I'm going from a group of four <laughs> numbers to that group uh, n plus four. Like I'm shifting that whole group by four. Okay, but I'm not missing any numbers. I'm still definitely going to hit every number uh, from this process. The other weird thing about it is uh, I cannot make one. Right, so it seems like I don't have a base case. Uh, my base case just doesn't work. Uh, and that's true, it doesn't work if we chose this to be our base case, but we're a bit more flexible. Uh, we don't always have to choose one to be the base case. We, we, know we, don't, we know we're not going to be able to prove it for these. Our best hope is to start with ones that we know we can prove it for. So 18 through 21, this is sort of my, this is like my base case here. Okay. So 18 through 21, checking those was my base case. And then the inductive, uh, the inductive part of the argument was shifting these up by four every time, which I'm allowed to do because I have a four cent coin. Okay, so conclusion is, not that I can make every amount, right? Conclusion is, but I can make every amount starting with my base case. So I can make uh, every amount st uh, you know, 18 cents or above. And also, I should, uh, and some lesser amounts, right? <laughs> and some lesser amounts. Um, but this is pretty cool. We proved we can make any amount um, above eight, uh, 18 cents. And this really is a proof by induction that we just did, okay? Even though it doesn't quite fit the standard uh, pattern. Okay, so I wanna do one more example of, uh, of induction. And this one's not going to fit the standard model uh, but this will be very important for us later. So uh, we want to prove that any positive number, a positive integer, let's say a greater than, greater or equal to two, um, can be written as a product of primes and only primes. Okay. Uh, so we aren't allowed to have anything in the product that's not a prime. Uh, let's see how this could work. So 20, uh, we can write 20 as uh, 2 times 2 times 5. Those are all primes, right? We're allowed to use the same one more than once, but um, okay, and the way you prove this is uh, you just kind of follow your nose. Uh, so 20, how, why is 20 a product of primes? Well, uh, let's just start by breaking up 20 into uh, any two factors. Let's say 4 and 5. And now we have two things that are smaller. Right? We have two things that are smaller. Um, 4 is not a prime, no. But uh, maybe we can break that up further into primes. Two and two, those are primes, so I'm circling them. And uh, five is also a prime, so we're done. And uh, this is really the idea. So um, we're going to uh, first check our base case. And there are a couple ways you can do this. You, you can say one is our base case and one is a product of primes. <laughs> one is not a prime though, but it's, it's sort of the, uh, I think a mathematician would tell you it's probably an, is an empty product. <laughs> it doesn't have anything in the product. Uh, so it is a product of primes. There's just nothing in the product. You could also have the base case be, uh, you know, every prime number. <laughs> Um, but this is maybe a, a nice way to, to do the argument. Um, the inductive step, notice that in order to prove the statement for 20, I am not relying on the fact that I can split 19 up into a product of primes. I'm relying on the fact that I can split 4 and 5 up into a product of primes. So this is a little bit tricky. Um, but, you know, this argument seems to work the same way, right? All, uh, the, the key is that we're breaking it down into 20 down to things that are smaller, right? Uh, so, so in the inductive step, what we can do is we can uh, assume uh, the statement is true for, uh, for all 
a number smaller than n. Okay, n is what we want to prove it for here. Um, is the statement true for n? I want to put a statement that you know the number can be written as a product of primes. Does a statement hold for n? Well, uh, let's say n is a prime, <laughs> right? Let's say we can't split it into anything other than one and one times itself, right? Uh, in this class, I'm always going to use p to represent a prime. By the way, <laughs> um, so so. Yeah, so if you see the letter P, uh, that's that's gonna be a prime number. So if it's prime, we're uh, th then we're we're done. So we're done. If it's not, then we can split it into two smaller numbers, A and B. And these are both uh, not equal to one, right? Uh, A is not equal to one. B is not equal to one. Uh, neither of them equal to n either, right? Or else one would be equal to one. So there are two, th two numbers that are smaller than n, right? Well, apply the induction, right? We're assuming that's true for anything smaller than n. So essentially we can write a as a product of primes. So this is a product of primes. We have a smaller than n. Yeah, so is it not equal to one or n? Um, and b is a product of primes. And n is just the product of these two products, right? So just write all the primes together in one product. And we've proven that n is a product of primes. Uh, so we're done there. And uh, the logic works equally well, but uh, we were a bit flexible with it. We, we didn't just keep track of whether the very previous case was true, but we kept track of all the cases before it as well. Okay, because in order to prove it for 20, we needed to rely on cases, uh, earlier cases like four and five. This is sometimes called strong induction. It's it's the same thing basically, but uh, uh, strong induction where we uh, assume it's true for everything below our number, and then use that use leverage all of that to prove that it's true for our number. Okay, so I was going to end the lecture there, but um, I can't resist showing you uh, just one more fun example. This is sort of a famous uh, example of induction. Um, th this is actually an important example because it shows you you need to be really careful uh, with the chain of, of logic that we're trying to create with induction. So uh, we're going to try to prove that all horses have the same color. All horses are the same color. And it's going to be a proof by uh, induction so where do we start? We start with a base case. So let's take uh, one horse. Is it true that any one horse, if, if the world only had one horse, is that the same color as itself? Well, sure. So definitely true. Uh, now we want to suppose that it's true for uh, n horses. Meaning if we have any, if we have n horses, they're all the same color, okay? What do we want to do? We want to show that it's true for n plus 1. We want to uh, show it's true for uh, n plus 1 horses. Uh, but that's not hard to do. And uh, the way you do it is, uh, I'll draw a picture here. So let's draw some amount of horses. So this will be n plus 1. Um, so here n is four, I guess, uh, and I want to show it's true for five. Okay, if I could draw any amount, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. The argument's going to be the same. Uh, okay, let's try to leverage this so it's true for n. So I'm going to take a group of four in this picture. What do I know about these four? They're all the same color. Let's say that's uh, black. Doesn't matter, whatever color it is, uh, these are all the same color. But now I'm gonna do something tricky and uh, look at 
another group of horses. I'm going to pretend that this is my world. It just contains these four horses. I know that uh, this statement is true for those, right? So uh, for these four horses, they're all the same color. These three I know are black. That means this one also has to be black, right? I wasn't sure before, but uh, now I know. And if we look at our picture, uh, we see that they all have to be the same color. That's the only way this can work out, right? So, so uh, we showed it. It's true for for uh, if we add one horse. Um, okay, <laughs> so what's wrong with this argument? Because uh, you've probably seen horses of various colors. Uh, there's got to be something wrong here. But uh, it's actually pretty tricky to spot. So, so this is actually a fun um, you know, pr problem to think about. So I'd encourage you to pause the video, try, try to figure out what what's wrong with this argument? What's wrong with the induction here? And uh, I won't leave you hanging. I'll, I'll let you know uh, what the answer is, but uh, feel free to pause. Okay, uh, so here's the problem with this argument. Um, first of all, this picture I drew, completely correct. Uh, the logic here is, com is completely correct. Uh, the base case is completely correct. Uh, so uh, the, the problem is um, I, I I was trying to deceive you uh, by drawing this picture. This does work from going, uh, let, me, let me draw this over here. So it works if we have, if we know it's true for four horses and we're trying to prove it's true for five, okay? That, uh, that absolutely works. If we have four horses and we know that any three are the same color, then we can prove that any four are the same color using the same kind of picture, okay? Uh, and I have one over here. I know it's true for one. So it looks like we're just going to get a uh, endless chain here. Um, if I know that any two horses are the same color, then I know that any three are. Let's draw that picture. Okay, so I know that these two have to be the same color. Let's say it's white this time. Um, but I also know that these two, see I can make a different group. These two have to be the same color. So this one is in both groups, so all three have to be the same. Here's where the uh, logic breaks down. <laughs> it does not work to go from one to two. So our induction step actually does not work for general n. It only works for large enough n, okay? That's what we had to be careful about uh, before also when we had the, uh, the coin problem. Um, didn't work for every, uh, every case. Um, but here's our induction, uh, our induction step that fails going from one to two. So this does not work. Okay. Why is that? Uh, let me draw this two picture, two horses. If I know that any one horse is the same color, I know this one's the same color. <laughs> I know this one's the same color, but see my, my two sets do not overlap as they do in these, these two pictures. Uh, so these could very well be different. Okay, so this proof fails, uh, but it's uh, kind of kind of a fun one to, to, to tell a friend, see if they can spot the uh, the problem with the logic, because uh, it's actually quite subtle. Um, by the way, one other attempt to do uh, to fix this is what we did with the coin problem, where we just moved up our base case. So we could have said, well, what if we start with the base case of two? Well, in that case, you're gonna have two horses that are different colors, so it doesn't work. <laughs> Um, so there's no way to repair this proof. Um, that's just a fun example. Uh, so that'll be it for this lecture. Thanks for watching.